Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Todd Clint's SharePoint Netcast number 189, recorded live Monday, February 17th, 2014. I am your host, and uh, sad to say that I did not meddle in men's falling down a snowy hill uh in the Olympics, Todd Clint, but but I but I but I made it back. I'm here. I'm I'm in good shape. Um, but I'm your host tonight, and of course, all of this is uh, made possible by the uh, tremendous folks at Rackspace.com. Well, uh, Rackspace, you can go to Rackspace.com. Uh, they gave me the flag, the monitor. They even let me borrow their PowerPoint template for my background. All that, all that stuff. So you can go to SharePoint.Rackspace.com. And find out about all the great SharePoint offerings we have. We will hopefully also be having some more things to uh, report on there. Some some new stuff hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Can't can't say can't spill the beans. Can't let the cat out of the bag. Uh, can't use any other uh, overused phrases. But there's potentially something coming up that you guys be able to check out. It's kind of in this sphere of things and all that. Uh, but anyway, go to SharePoint.RecSpace.com. we got free trials of multi-tenant SharePoint. we got blog articles. we got some other stuff. And in a couple of weeks when the SharePoint conference starts, we're going to have some other cool stuff. So uh, get that one in your browser. Get it in your favorites uh, so that you can, uh, you can get there uh, when all the fun stuff starts. Move on now to production notes. Production went pretty well last week. Got everything rendered out. I probably could have gotten the uh, RSS feeds updated uh, quickly, but didn't. And Ellis, who is not in the chat room right now, shame, shame, called me out on Twitter. And so I got those out there, but that's, uh, everything went pretty well. Uh, one thing that came up last week is the ads on Ustream. So the folks of you, and boy, there's just a ton of you tonight on the, in the chat room watching this mess live. Um, when you watch it, I stream this on Ustream, uh, Ustream.tv, and you get ads and the ads always seem to come like somebody will ask me a question in the chat room and then an ad will come up and they'll miss my brilliant, uh, insightful and witty answer. And so everybody complains about that, about the ads. So my uh, recommendation for that is for $4 a month, uh, you can get rid of all of the ads on all of Ustream. So you'll get uh, rid of all the ads here and all of the ads on anything else you uh, watch on Ustream. And I promise you, any other thing that you watch on Ustream will be better than this. So it's money well spent, really. $4 a month, you get rid of all of the ads. And I mentioned that last week, and somebody mentioned that uh, they didn't want to pay Ustream the $4. They, wa they would be much happier paying me the $4. Well, and I appreciate that. Uh, I'm not in this for the money, obviously. I would have a very hungry family in a very small house if I did this for a living. Uh, but for those of you who've been suffering through this netcast for a while, you'll remember I used to be on StickCam, and StickCam went out of business. And I can't help but think that if they would have made more money from their ads or people paying them, they wouldn't have gone out of business. And... Ustream lets me stream for free. I got the basic package. It doesn't cost me anything. Got a fairly decent little client and all that kind of stuff. So I don't discourage folks from paying Ustream the $4. I don't want the $4. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm honored that you want to send it to me, but I would much prefer you send the $4 to Ustream. Keep them going. Keep this platform going for me. Keep it going for everybody else. So don't, uh, don't, don't worry about that. But if you don't like the, uh, the ads, send the Ustream the $4. And, uh, and then you get rid of the ads here and all that. In the chat room, folks are talking about uh, maybe doing YouTube or something like that. I have been authorized to uh, do live streams on YouTube. It's kind of a lot of work. you got to download a bunch of encoders and stuff. I looked at it a little bit and uh, it didn't, didn't want to go to all the hassle. But maybe I need to revisit that. Maybe that's gotten better. So another thing, Ali in the chat room is mentioning, if only I could drum up some sort of a relationship with a company that's got a lot of bandwidth and all that. Well, obviously, Rackspace would be happy to do that. It's not a matter of bandwidth so much as it's a matter of software. And Rackspace doesn't have a streaming service. So I could you know, go to all the trouble of standing up a streaming server on a Rackspace server and, and things like that. But um, it's just... 
Ustream just works. I just open up a web browser, I hit go live, and it just it just goes and just works. So it's not a bandwidth issue, it's a time issue. Um, I will say, and nobody in the chat room has asked about it yet, but on Wednesdays at 11 in the morning, Central Time, some of my coworkers do a thing called the SharePoint uh, Power Hour, and that is streamed live on YouTube, and they do that with Google Hangouts. That's not so bad. That's a possibility, I suppose. I could do it like that. I uh, haven't looked into that a bunch, but uh, honestly, I don't think Ustream is bad, and I would have to try the the Google Hangouts through YouTube thing to see uh, to see if that's it. But again, it's four four dollars a month for Ustream, and again, there's a ton of other shows out there that are way better than this. Um, so, but I, I don't want you guys to think that I'm not open to suggestions. If Google Hangouts are the wave of the future and all that. Let me know. Like I said, I've been on a couple of those. I was on the Power Hour thing last time and uh, and all that. So Fernando in the chat room is saying Skype. I don't know of a way to broadcast one to many in Skype, so I haven't uh, done that. <laughs> Doug in the chat room says I could set up a streaming service on Azure and pay uh, some number out to about 27 significant digits. Uh, again, um, it's all about interface, and I, I could probably do that with Azure, but then I don't know how you guys would watch it, all that. But but by all means, Doug, you've got my email address, probably got my phone number. Uh, also, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. I want to make this better, so if, if there's a way I can do it better, by all means, uh, by all means, shout it out. Um, but 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 don't worry about uh, sending you stream that four dollars. Doesn't bother me at all. And one thing that's uh, that's come up a couple of weeks now is people have uh, missed out on the netcast. and like, oh, I forgot. Now, I assume <laughs> when people say, oh, I forgot, what they really mean was I had no intention of watching that thing, but I don't want to tell him right to his face that he sucks because that's a little awkward. I, I normally figure that's code. But if you really do uh, want to watch this thing live, and heaven, I, I, I worry about how boring your life must be, but if you do want to watch this thing live, I thought about doing like email reminders, like sending out emails to people, and then you can also email, uh, you know, SMS messages. If anybody has any interest in that, I know we've talked about it before, but if anybody uh, is, is interested in that, let me know. I've I've thought about it. I played with it a little bit last week with a couple of people just to see what uh, what their thought was on it. But uh, you know, I would send it out, and I would send out you know, like a link to the chat room and that kind of stuff. So. If there's any interest in that, I could do that. It wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be too tough to do with PowerShell. Uh, Daniel Glenn in the chat room it says uh, yes, that uh, that is awesome. More spam. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm here for. So, uh, but just because people have mentioned it, and again, I assume that they're just being polite, and what they really mean to say is your show sucks, and there's no way I'd watch it live. And I can't argue with that. I, I can't argue with that. But um, if somebody wants some kind of a live thing, I could I could do that. Something a little more. Uh, in your face, sort of. Uh, so that was all that. All right, let's move on to the topics. Got a busy show tonight. I don't know if I'm going to get it all in tonight. Uh, the first thing that I want to mention, and I want to mention it early in the, the show in case people tune out. We're already eight minutes in. I've probably lost half my audience as it is. But uh, Johnny, who is in the chat room there, emailed me and said that he wanted to buy a signed copy of SharePoint 2013 Professional Administration, which I don't have one within arm's reach. Um, and so he was wondering if I would take it to the SharePoint conference. I'm like, yeah, that's uh, that's a great idea. And then I don't have to ship it. So I worked it out with Johnny, but if you are going to be at the SharePoint conference and you want a signed copy of the SharePoint 2013 book, let me know. We're not doing any book signings um, this year that I know of. Just the books a year and what a year and a half old, something like that, and so we just didn't decide to do it yet. So there's not going to be any opportunities to get free ones, so uh, you know because that's really the best price for them. But if you do want a copy of the book, um, let me know. Send me an email, todd.clint at rackspace.com, and we'll figure it out. It won't be the full fifty bucks since I don't have to ship it. Uh, we'll we'll cut it back. I, I made Johnny a deal, uh, and I'll make uh, make you a deal too. So. If you want a copy, I've got some uh, got some sitting right there, right outside the old office. So if you're interested, give me a shout. On the heels of that, I noticed today that my spc.sharepointconference.com is online. So you can go out there now 
and start creating your schedule and your all that kind of stuff. So go out there and do that. Again, Shane and I are doing three sessions and a pre-conference, so add those to your session. I need to blog that and put, like, you know, ICS file so it goes into your calendar. I haven't done that yet. Uh, but we've got the the load testing session um, with uh, Visual Studio 2013, and we've got the upgrade session and the PowerShell session. So go ahead and uh, go ahead and add those to your My SPC. Watch our videos that are out there. They're very uh, informative and hopefully just a touch entertaining. And one other thing that I have thought about, uh, uh, so Vlad from SharePoint Community is going to be at the Visual Studio load testing one, so I might need some extra security there if anybody wants to sit up front uh, just in, key, in case he gets lippy, starts... Um, you never know. It could happen. I'm just saying. Um, but one thing that we've talked about is having some kind of a, a meetup for the the netcast hooligans, the folks that are live in the chat room, and there's about a hundred of them now. It looks like holy cow! Um, a bunch of you guys are going to the uh, SharePoint conference, and then there's a bunch of you guys that download it. So I've been thinking about having some kind of a meetup. The problem is everybody's nights are full. There's a hundred parties going on, and there's like three nights, so nights are uh, nights uh, nights are tough. So I was thinking about maybe having some kind of a maybe a breakfast get together, um, something like that. I don't know. That's kind of early, but uh, maybe or I know Monday. Um, I don't have any sessions. Still trying to get my time slot for recording this mess live there. Uh, I email about once a week. Try not to be uh, try not to be a pain in the butt. But um, th so I don't know the time for that. But if anybody wants to get together, wants to do some kind of an official uh, meetup, I would be happy to do it whenever. So, and w so if it helps you guys decide, Eric Harlan in the chat room makes it sound like he will not be there for breakfast. So I think that's really a vote for breakfast, honestly. But uh, if anybody wants to get together and do something, let me know because. There's just so little free time, and everybody's, you know, it's tough. But I would love to get together and just uh, just uh, see what's going on. <laughs> so so now they're thinking that the, the breakfast really is 4 a.m. At a, at a Denny's or a Waffle House or something. <laughs> I could do that. I'm not, I'm not above that. Um, yeah, so one thing to keep in mind, yeah, is I don't drink, so I don't stay up very late because I just I don't have that fueling me so i do get up at a, re a reasonable time but think about that if you've got ideas again uh at todd clint on twitter or todd dot clint uh, at rackspace.com i'll get get some consensus if you've got some ideas and then we'll uh we'll figure something out but i do want to say hello to everybody if anybody's out there and wants to say hey i would uh, i would do that all right the next topic i will try to keep this one short i, I make no promises again in the chat room if i start hyperventilating or uh, or anything like that, you know, calm me down, something like that. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about how if you buy a year's worth of the Xbox Music Store for your uh, Windows Phone, if you if you pay for a year, it's ninety nine dollars. And Microsoft is running this special where if you buy that for a year, you get a Lumia five twenty for free. That's pretty cool. So we've talked about the 520 uh, a bunch. It's it's the entry level Windows Phone 8 phone, but it's a great little phone, and it's uh, for AT and T. So you can go out and you can buy. If you got AT and T, you can just drop your SIM in there and it'll just work. Or you can get an AT and T Go phone SIM and that'll work. Or you can even use it without a SIM at all. You can just use it on Wi Fi. It's a great little uh, music player and GPS and all kinds of things like that. And since they're giving away the Xbox, you know, it comes with the Xbox music stuff. That's perfect. I mean, it's like a like a, a little a little MP3 player. It's got a SD slot in it. You can't beat it. So I told you guys about that on uh, Monday the 3rd, I think. So then I went out. Yeah, Monday the 3rd. So I went out and I ordered one on Tuesday. And... Then didn't get any kind of confirmation or anything like that. So then I went out and ordered another one on Wednesday because I thought it uh, got screwed up or something. So then I got a call from them shortly after that saying, hey, did you really mean to order two? And I said, no, I thought the first one got lost. The guy's like, nah, no problem. If you don't get a confirmation email from us in like an hour, call us back at this number. And I didn't. So um, called them back. Long story short, it's two weeks later. I don't have a phone. I don't have an Xbox Music Pass. I have probably talked to them on the phone nine times, maybe, and 
So in, in looking around, like on WPCentral.com and some other sites, it looks like they just screwed up. So they, they, they ran me through the ringer. They're like, hey, your, uh, your card got denied. And I'm like, I don't think so. I've got an Amex, and I know what that's like when they try to deny the card. My phones ring and, and stuff like that. And uh, none of that happened. So I called Amex, and Amex says, no, we've got two charges here. Uh, and they're real charges. They're not uh, just authorizations. They're actual charges. And so, again, here we are two weeks later. Still don't have my phone. Still don't have a confirmation number. Don't know what's going on with all that. But it looks like there's a bunch of us that that happened to. So I've talked to a couple of you guys that have ordered this because of, uh, you know, hearing about it on the netcast and then going out and ordering it, and you've gotten yours. So I know that there's something there, but I, I've heard some people think that uh, they ran out of 520s, something like that. So if you have ordered a 520 and haven't gotten it yet, supposedly tomorrow they're going to go through, and I would be curious if you did order the Xbox Music thing and did get your 520, you know, how, how your situation went. So they've told me now that tomorrow it will ship. <laughs> I'm not uh, I'm not holding my breath, but I would love to get a hold of it. I would love to play with it, especially with uh, with some other stuff that I'm going to talk about later in the show. Um, but so if you did go through that and you had a bunch of problems, I apologize. I uh, I didn't didn't know that was going to happen, but we'll see. Um, so here's some SharePoint content. Here is one that I was asked about in or on Twitter last week. Somebody was looking for. Uh, information on setting up SharePoint 2010 in an extranet. And so uh, this was a really good blog post on TechNet, and it's kind of a link to a bunch of other blog posts on setting up SharePoint 2010 for extranet environments. And extranets are this kind of thing where you've got internal folks and you've got vendors or whoever using the same environment, using the same farm, and how to set that up. So it talks about licensing and it talks about authentication and it talks about... Uh, all kinds of other stuff, you know, how to set up your web apps and zones and reverse proxies and things like that. So on Twitter, the the person just said, hey, I need some help setting up extranets on SharePoint 2010. And I sent them this link. Well, actually, I think they found it on their own and said, hey, this is a great place, uh, great place to get started because it really does cover everything. There's like 11, 11 points on it. I noticed some of the folks that had their hand in writing this thing, a guy named Brian Porter, uh, Steve Walker, Ali Mazahari, all folks that I know, though they would absolutely deny knowing me, uh, all very smart folks, uh, to Jeshwar Singh also. So all kinds of good stuff. So if you have any questions about setting up SharePoint 2010 with an extranet, that's, uh, that's a good article to read. And most of it, not all of it, but most of it is also applicable to SharePoint 2013. So it talks about a bunch of the architecture stuff, um, that you just you don't always think about because now you're exposing your stuff to the big bad scary internet and uh, and you gotta you gotta give that some thought so that's a good primer and you know like I I told the guy on Twitter if you've got any specific questions give me a shout this one again has has some good good starting spots on it um, and I see it was published a very timely post published published eight twenty sixth of twenty eleven. Yes. Um, so that was a good one. Wanted to get that one out there. And here was another uh, interesting one that I can't remember where I saw, but it talks about how the require SSL checkbox is not supported in SharePoint 2010. So the article is it's only a week old. It was published uh, last Monday or nah, a week, ten days ago, February seventh. But um, it talks about, how, and it's very, very brief. It's kind of confusing. But it says that checking the require SSL checkbox for a SharePoint web application is not supported in SharePoint 2010. And they're kind of cagey because, you know, when you create a web app, there's that checkbox that says, hey, require SSL. I don't think they mean that one because in the more information box, they say in Internet Information Services. So I think they mean when you go into IIS Manager and you pick a site, there's the SSL thing in the settings, and you set that, and you uh, you hit open, and there's a checkbox in there for require SSL. I think they're saying that that is not supported for SharePoint 2010. Um, this was just a weird one, though, because if I would have been asked this a week ago, if somebody would have said, hey, is this supported? I would have said, 
Absolutely, I am positive of this, and I would have been absolutely wrong. So kind of wanted to give that one uh, a mention because it's uh, it's uh, kind of a weird one. So don't do it in IIS. I assume when you create your web app, if you uh, if you check the IIS, the require uh, SSL there, that's probably uh, probably okay. And Doug in the chat room uh, makes a good point that they, they want to manage all that in SharePoint so that SharePoint knows. And we haven't talked about that in a while. And I don't know if, if we'll get into the whole thing now, but anytime you can make a change in SharePoint as opposed to IIS or on the file system or something, you absolutely should because if you make it in SharePoint, if you make it in Central Admin or PowerShell or something like that, then it ends up in the config database. Not a huge deal unless you change anything. So like, uh, like Doug mentioned in the chat room, they want to manage that in SharePoint. So let's say you don't do it in SharePoint. You create your web app. It's on HTTP, everything's going, you add your certificate, you do all that business, and then you go into IIS and you check the require SSL uh, in there. That might work. The, the tech article just says, you know, crazy things will happen, uh, you know, your tires will go flat and your cat will get shaved and all that kind of stuff. But what if it works? Probably go along weeks, months, whatever, and it works. And then you add another web front end to your farm. How does it get configured? Well, since you did all that stuff outside of SharePoint, when you start the web front end role on that server, you know, the configuration database looks at all the settings for web front ends and spits them all out to that new box. If you didn't make that change in SharePoint, SharePoint can't make that change to your new server. So uh, that's the, the biggest reason that you want to do that stuff inside of SharePoint so that it's in your config uh, database. The other reason is because if your web config file on your server gets screwed up or any number of other things in IIS, if they get screwed up, you can just stop that web for an end service, service instance, on the box. It will pull all that stuff out of IIS. And then if you restart it, it will repopulate all that kind of wipe the slate clean. But again, if you've done stuff outside of SharePoint after you, or when you do that, then those things aren't going to get done. And there's a certain amount of that you can't get away with, I can't get away from, things like SSL certs, things like that. But you should do as much in uh, SharePoint as you can. All right. So here's another one. I've been asked this a couple of times in the last couple of weeks. And I can't remember which uh, build it is. Shame on me for not knowing. But on one of the recent either SharePoint 2010 or SharePoint 2013 patches, I forget, on my patch page, I've got that the build number is 1005 or something like that, uh, 1001. But then the SharePoint services patch comes in at build 1005. So when people go into their farm, they see the farm is at 101, but there are components at 1005, and they get a little nervous. They get worried. They think something's not up because they don't have the latest number. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the two different build numbers. Starting with SharePoint 2010, we had multiple build numbers. SharePoint 2003 and SharePoint 2007 had a build number just one. With 2010, you have the farm build number, and your databases can have build numbers, and every component inside of SharePoint can have a build number. So search can be different than user profile service, uh, than SharePoint Foundation, all that kind of stuff. So when I'm talking about which build you want to be checking for your patches, I'm talking about the farm build number. And if you look at both of the blog post for those builds at uh, toddclint.com slash sp2010 builds and slash sp2013 builds, I show you how to get the farm build number, and that's the one that you care about. So if you've got that, um, you're going to be fine. So in the, in the particular question, people are saying, hey, my farm is at 1001, but this patch is at 1005. Am I okay? Yeah, probably so. Uh, there are a couple of ways if you're if you're nervous, you know, if you think something's not set up right, you can, excuse me, go into the upgrade tab in Central Admin, and there's a couple of places you can go in there to check status. If you need to run the configuration wizard or patches are missing or something, it'll tell you in there. The other thing you can do is you can go out to the PowerShell and run STSADM-O local upgrade status, and it will tell you if something's out of whack, but don't get uh, don't get um, worked up if your farm build number is less than a component build number. Um, 
So there is that one. Uh, so I added a couple of uh, weeks ago, months ago, I forget, the Office Web Apps patches to the uh, SP2013's builds page. So those are out there now. If you, Because uh, OWA is now a separate farm, separate machines. You can patch them independently of SharePoint. So I added those a month or so ago and had a couple of questions about this last week. So one of the things when you patch the Office web apps, you see, you'll see references to rebuilding your farm. They're talking about your Office web apps farm, not your SharePoint farm. So again, remember you've got your SharePoint servers over here and your Office web app servers are over here and they cannot be the same physical boxes. There's just no way to do it. When you set up the Office web apps, when you patch it, what really happens is the old version uninstalls and the new version reinstalls. And so you end up having to rebuild it, reconnect it to SharePoint and all that. Um, so don't get freaked out about rebuilding your farm because you're just rebuilding your Office web apps farm. That, that's it. And if you want to have less downtime, everything's virtualized these days. So you can bring up uh, two new boxes, put the new version of Office web apps on, point SharePoint to that, tear the old ones down and, and destroy them and all that. And then also, like Doug in the chat room mentions, you've got your SharePoint farm, you've got your Office web app farm, you've got your workflow farm. Uh, they're all separate farms. Farms are all the rage these days, so uh, don't get worried about that. But then the person who was talking about this was putting the December 2013 cumulative update on for the Office web apps. It fixed a bunch of problems, but the biggest one was it fixed a bunch of problems with iPads, with iOS browsers. So uh, if you're having problems with that, that's a good one. And uh, Victor uh, Weiland has some good blog posts on that. I should have linked one of those. I think I link his thing in my... SharePoint 2013, I forget, um, but he's got a couple blog posts on that, so that's good. Check those out. Speaking of patches, last week we talked about how to get the version of SharePoint Online. So somebody mentioned that they would like to have me keep track of the SharePoint Online versions. I didn't think that was going to be possible for two reasons. Number one, because they don't announced that and number two I didn't uh, I didn't know of a way to get that and in the uh, week now I found a way to do that so coreypeters.net has a blog post from July of 2013 that tells exactly how to do that essentially there are a couple of connection uh, files you can go to uh, slash so go to SharePoint dot, you know whatever your uh, your thing is uh, so I guess they got, he's got .sharepoint.com here, but there's a couple of URLs you can go to. One of them will give you the SharePoint version that's running, you know, 16 dot whatever. And then the other one is what's a what's called a complete build version. And I don't know what th those are. Uh, I don't do a lot with Office 365, but you can use those two URLs to see exactly which version of Office 365 is running uh, in SharePoint Online. And that becomes important because as Corey talks about in his blog post, they roll these patches whenever, you know, like you could be running one version of SharePoint Online on Tuesday and get up Wednesday morning and have a completely different version and not know anything about it. And um, this throws off some third-party stuff. So we've seen this a few times. Jeremy Thake had a blog post about it. Um, third parties getting broken by updating the patches. So it's good to know. Uh, you know what builds out there for no other reason than if you've got somebody that works and somebody that doesn't, you can uh, you can go back and forth and check their versions. But since I'd mentioned last week, I didn't know how this could be done. I thought I would uh, would bring this up. Uh, <laughs> they're having a heyday with the fact that I don't do much with Office 365. In the chat room, here is another great link. So last week we talked about a blog post from oh where is it at don't tell me i know this one okay i don't know this one um last week or the week before i talked about a, oh there it is two weeks ago netcast 187 i talked about a blog post from all that nerdy stuff.com that talks about how to optimize the battery in your surface pro and surface pro 2 um and he's got some great stuff in there. One of the things that I do, my, my main computer is a Surface Pro 2. That's what I use day in and day out. And I've got the little uh, Dell Venue Pro dealy here. These are boxes that have um, 
you know, limited resources. This has only got two gig of RAM. The tablet's got eight. But normally when I'm using these, especially if I'm traveling, I want to get the maximum amount of battery life that I can out of it. So all these things that, you know, save battery life really help. One of the things that I do is anytime I install a program, I go into Task Manager and there's a startup tab that tells you what things automatically start up with the machine. And I shut everything off. So Dropbox doesn't get to start automatically, none of that stuff because everything that's running is sucking up battery that I don't want. Um, so, <laughs> so that blog post I talked about on all that nerdy stuff.com talks about a bunch of things you can tweak. Another thing, like, like I said that I do is I go to task manager, that startup tab and, uh, and, and just kind of keep an eye on what automatically starts up with my boxes. There's all kinds of stuff that, uh, that show up in there. So this week I was reminded of a Sys internals tool called Auto Runs that does the same thing as the that startup tab in Task Manager, but like a hundred times better. So it's not just uh, like if that Task Manager tab, uh, you know, had, was on steroids. It's not just stronger; it's also smarter. So it's like that tab uh, got hopped up on steroids and then went out and got an MBA or a PhD or something. It shows it's got like 11 tabs or something crazy like that of all the different startup locations. And it shows stuff like browser helper objects and just all kinds of anything that's trying to get into your system and run. Um, that thing shows it. And then if you've got Procmon, I believe, set uh, can, um, installed to, you can fire up Procmon from there for, for a specific, uh, specific program. So as a system administrator, you have to be familiar with the Sys internals tools, and this is another good one, but you don't think about running that stuff always on your, you know, your tablet or whatever. So this is a good one to have on your tablet, especially after you've installed a few things just to see what's, uh, what's going on on that box and sapping your beloved battery life. I had that, uh, had that happen to me the last time I traveled. Dropbox is notorious for killing battery life because it's just constantly going out trying to sink your stuff. And I don't have it start up automatically when I start my tablet, but the last time I traveled, I had everything set up. I had my monitors, my power, my wired network, all that. And I uh, just grabbed my tablet and went. And then got on a plane and started watching movies and noticed my battery wasn't great. It's because I hadn't shut all that stuff off. And uh, so so it's not enough to not start it. If you just you know, undock, you gotta you got to remember to stop that stuff. So in the chat room, I'm getting a lot of hell for using Dropbox instead of SkyDrive or OneDrive. I use them both. Dropbox does two things way better than SkyDrive or OneDrive. And until SkyDrive or OneDrive add these two things, I will not give Dropbox up. The first thing is Dropbox supports files greater than 2 gig. OneDrive does not. And you might not need that. And if that's not something you need, that's awesome. Then then you're cool but I absolutely need files larger than two gig one example is I have I bought some extra space on Dropbox my server that hosts my blog does database backups dumps them into Dropbox they get automatically copied to one of my local servers here those files are greater than two gig so I can't use SkyDrive or OneDrive for that the other thing that SkyDrive and OneDrive um, doesn't do that Dropbox does is if I share a folder with somebody on Dropbox and they uh, you know they accept and all that they can have that folder sync to their file system automatically they don't need to go to the Dropbox website if I put something in SkyDrive and I share it with somebody the only way they can get to it is to go to the SkyDrive website and that kind of stinks and so um, those are the two things I use both of those things all the time and until SkyDrive can do both of those things, I can't get rid of Dropbox. So, but I will tell you that having moved over to Windows Phone and uh, Windows tablets and all that, I use SkyDrive about a thousand times more than I did, you know, six months or a year ago because everything syncs there. Speaking of Windows Phone, uh, we got uh, Windows 8.1. We got that last year. That's uh, generally been decided as a good thing we're going to be getting an update for windows 8.1 here pretty quick it will include some more stuff but windows phone windows phone's kind of been left out it's still running windows phone 8 now we did just get the black update which was nice that was, had some good stuff in it i'm a big fan of that but it's still windows 8 so last week 
we started seeing some leaks about what was going to be in Windows Phone 8.1. And there is a list as long as my arm and then as long as my other arm and halfway down my leg. There's a whole bunch of stuff, so I'm not going to cover all of it. But you can go to any place that covers this stuff in the chat room. I linked a WP, WPCentral.com article, but it's everywhere. It's on Engadget. It's all the, all that stuff. But a few of the things I did want to talk about that, that for, at least for me, will be important is um, with Windows Phone 8.1, you'll be able to change your default SMS app. So right now, you can't do that. You have the SMS app that comes with Windows Phone, and it's good. It's not bad. But you can't swap that out for anything else. When I was on Android, there were a bunch of really great SMS apps, and I really enjoyed kind of moving those around. Windows Phone, I can't do that. The other thing that it will hopefully open up is the ability for third-party apps to get into your SMSs. Now, this kind of sounds like a scary thing, like a bad thing, and I can understand that. But one of the things that's been getting a lot of press lately is this idea of smartwatches. And so smartwatches like the Pebble and Samsung has one and Apple is rumored to be having one come out. But the Pebble app for Windows Phone, which is kind of a beta and kind of a rough thing, can't show you SMSs. Because on the Windows Phone uh, platform, apps can't get into SMSs. So that would be a great, you know, if you had the Pebble app and the Pebble phone and all that, you could uh, you, you could do those kind of things. So that that's coming in 8.1. Another big one is swipe-like support. So for those of you who have used Android, there's a swipe keyboard. With swipe, instead of tapping the letters that you want, uh, you just put your finger down and you just touch them. You just draw. You swipe your finger across the board. And I didn't really dig it much on Android. I had a pretty good keyboard on Android that I liked. But a bunch of people like swipe. And it looks like Windows 8.1 is going to add support for swipe. So that will be good. There will be much cheering and much rejoicing for that. Uh, another thing that they're adding is geofencing. And that... Um, I'm curious about, so it looks like you'll be able to pick out, you know, fence in areas and then have stuff happen if you go in or out of those areas. And one of the, the links that, that Windows uh, or WP Central talks about is if you use IFTT, uh, IFTTT, if this, then that, uh, which is a, a website where you can set up things. If this happens, then do this. You know, if I go into this location, then send me this text, that kind of stuff. So it talks about how the geofencing might work in with that. So I don't know for sure how I would use that, but it's it's interesting. Um, and one, one way that I can think of uh, is there's a Mexican restaurant about a mile from here that my wife and I eat at all the time. And one of their plates always comes with, uh, guacamole. And I don't like guacamole, but when I order it, I always forget to say no guac because in my head it doesn't have guac. And so <laughs> I was thinking this geofencing thing would be great. Every time I walk into this restaurant, my phone should send me a message. Don't forget to uh, not have the guac. So we'll see if that works out. In the chat room, uh, Vlad's mentioning that they're essentially adding Google Talk and the swipe keyboard. Yeah, the swipe keyboard. And I don't know, this Nokia 920 is the only windows phone that i've had but it does a bunch of this voice to text stuff so i don't know what of that is nokia and what of that is windows phone but like when i'm in my car if i get text messages it asks me questions and i can say reply and all that kind of stuff um and uh so so i don't know but on the the heels of that the next thing that i wanted to mention is cortana and that's kind of the Siri type thing that's coming to Windows Phone. Now, those of you that have had an Xbox ever and played the Halo games, you'll remember Cortana is like the thing inside of the helmet that uh, you can, you know, that the the Master Chief talks to. So I don't think Cortana is probably going to be what the product's really called, but it's that, uh, but it's that same kind of thing. You're going to be able to ask it questions like Siri, I imagine. So that'll be kind of neat. Um, another uh, interesting thing they're going to have is quiet hours. You'll be able to set up times in which you won't get, you know, messages or, you know, your your phone won't ring, things like that. That's another thing I had in Android that I'm going to uh, gonna that I missed a little bit that I'm gonna be uh, nice to have back. And finally, one of the things that they're going to be adding is the ability to install apps to an SD card. 
That's something that Android's had for a while, but I noticed that after they added it, it was real exciting for a while, and then developers, uh, there was a bit that developers could flip in the app that would not allow it, and most of them did that. So I don't know that that's really going to take off or not. Because, number one, a bunch of the um, Windows 8 phones don't have SD cards. My 920 doesn't. Uh, I think the 1520 does. I think the 1020 doesn't. So that's not going to affect a lot of people. And then the other thing is just, you know, if apps can't, uh, can't be installed in the SD card, who knows. Now, I heard a couple of other things, and I haven't researched this much, but it looks like they're kind of breaking out the whole uh, People Hub thing. So, you know, right now you've got, um, if you open up your Windows phone, you've got the People Hub, and it kind of aggregates all your social stuff. I thought it was kind of dumb when I first got, first heard about it but i kind of like it now and i kind of use it a lot so i can see the you know, the twittering and the facebooking and all that kind of stuff and it aggregates across all of your social stuff so i've got linkedin and twitter and facebook and all that kind of stuff um but it sounds like they might be taking that out they might be removing that uh there's going to be a standalone facebook app on the phone which i've got a standalone facebook app now but but again it, i'm a little worried so we'll see um We'll see. And I just threw mine on my wireless charger. Um, so we'll see how that all turns out. Now, what uh, what I don't know is how to get a hold of Windows Phone 8.1. Apparently, it's just for developers now, so I haven't seen that. If I ever do get that Lumia 520 and can swap back and forth, then I might try to get hold of that Windows Phone 8.1. But just know that it's it's out there. Check that out. And uh, if you've got a Windows, 8 point, a Windows Phone 8, it's going to be coming out. Another thing for Windows Phone 8 that I found this week, which was kind of cool, was they added, uh, at least for the Nokia ones, DLNA support. So DLNA is supports the Digital Lifestyle Networking Association or something like that. And it's that thing where if you pull up a picture on your phone or your tablet, if you've got a DLNA thing out there, you can make it show up on your TV or, or your computer or whatever. Again, that was a thing that I uh, enjoyed a lot with, with Android, so it was cool. I could take a video of my kids and then hit a button, and it would show up on my TV, just like things work out of the commercials. And everything can be a DLNA target these days, like my TV can, my Blu-ray disc player can, my little Western Digital Media Box can, my DirecTV receivers can, so it's really great. I think my toaster can. I think it can do a thing. So that's cool that they've added that. It's confusing how it's exposed, though. So in the the App Store now, there is a Play 2 app and a Nokia Play 2 app. And the Play 2 app did not work on my uh, Nokia Lumia 920, but the Nokia Play 2 app did. And it's real basic. You fire it up, you fire up the Play 2 app, and it says, do you want to, you know, do you want to play a, a music file, a video file, or a picture? You pick what you want, you pick the device, and poof, it just shows up. So for me, it was the TV. I could start flipping through pictures I'd taken. They show up on the TV. It's kind of cool stuff. So if you have a Windows 8 phone, go out to the App Store, look for Play 2, and it should uh, it should up, should up uh, should show up there. Okay, a couple more things, and I will let you go. And this, this last one will be real quick. It seems like you can't open up a news site these days without finding out some um, – some website that's been hacked. I mean, Target got hacked, and, and every, you know, Neiman Marcus or whoever. I mean, it's just always happening. Uh, and last week, the one that came up was Kickstarter. Kickstarter got hacked. And so if you had a Kickstarter account, I mean, you've already heard this by now, of course, but if you have a Kickstarter account, for goodness sakes, change your passwords. The point of this wasn't to tell you about Kickstarter because, again, you probably already knew about it, but just to talk about some strategies because this, this is going to keep coming. This is just going to keep happening. It, it, it happens all the time. The hackers are getting better. And so if you haven't already kind of changed your strategy on online accounts and passwords, now is probably a good time to do it. So there's a bunch of different things out there. <laughs> Folks in the chat room are chanting uh, LastPass and some other ones. Those are good ideas. But kind of the big things, kind of overarching things, whether you're using LastPass or not, I kind of had uh, three things that I wanted to talk about. Number one was gone are the days where it is safe to use the same password in more than one uh, location. So back in the day, you know, 10 years ago, I had, you know, 
my email address and like three or four different passwords that kind of rotated through those days are gone. Can't do that anymore because Kickstarter is going to get hacked and they're going to get that password and your email address and, and whatever. You just can't, you can't do that anymore. So you need to have a separate password for every place that you go. And that can be troublesome to keep track of. So in the chat room, folks are talking about last pass. They're talking about keep pass. There's some other password management things. Hell, even if you just have like a, a OneNote or an Excel file that's locked, uh, you know, protected, those aren't great. Google unlock a Word file to find out how not great they are. But anything as long as you don't have the same password everywhere. And I'm also, uh, I don't like using the word password anymore because all of my stuff now is past phrases. Everything that I use to get into thing is now a sentence. It's not just a word. Uh, so, I mean, and it's easy to remember, and I usually make the, the, the passphrase be something specific to the site so that it's easy to key off of. And if you may have a passphrase and it's going to have you know, capital letters at the beginning of the sentence, it's going to have punctuation at the end, it's going to have spaces, it's going to have all that kind of stuff. I don't do any fancy, uh, you know, putting zeros for O's. That gets too complicated for me to... Uh, <laughs> To remember, Eric in the chat room is uh, scribbling down all my notes because he can start hacking my stuff. Have at it. <laughs> if you have to steal my identity, your identity is... Uh, uh, so again, different passwords for every site. Um, the next thing that I wanted to recommend was different email addresses for every site. Now, depending on who your email provider is, that may or may not be possible. I've got my email at Rackspace, of course. And one of the things that I can do for a mailbox is just give it multiple email addresses. So if I'm uh, if I'm signing up for uh, you know Tiddlywinks online or something, that email address might be Tiddlywinks at you know uh, Clint.com or whatever. So that helps again with the whole when they pull the password username and password list down, they're not going to be able to know your login to other places. It's also handy if you start getting spammed from some place, you can just kill that email address and make it go away. But if your email provider um, offers that, um, then that's another uh, another good idea. So, some folks in the uh, the chat room have some other things. A couple of folks have mentioned that some old places won't let you have things in passwords, so you can get hung up with sentences. That does stink. Um, another one is oh, there's another one I want to mention. Um, yeah, so Jared is saying that he has a whole domain and every email address goes into one account. That's another way to do it. Um, but just if you can have the multiple email addresses, it uh, it was a little cumbersome at first when I started doing it, but man, I wouldn't do it any other way now. It is great. So for every online place that I go, like Ustream, for instance, or any that kind of stuff, has its own email address and its own password. So if it ever gets hacked, I'm good to go. The third thing that I wanted to mention is any place that you go, if it offers uh, two-factor authentication, you might also see that uh, called TFA, but two-factor authentication, so I think like Office 365 just announced they do that, Live.com does it, Google does that. Um, so that's this idea that you have to put a password in and then they text you a code on your phone and you got to put that in something like that. Two factors, a password and something else. And, it, and the way that was all described to me when it first came out was it's a combination of something you know, your password, and something you have. So like uh, at, uh, at Rackspace, and you've, you guys have seen these before, we have these RSA fobs. And it's got a rotating number on it that you know rotates through once a minute. So this is the second factor. This is something that I have. Um, so if you can enable any of that kind of stuff with you know Google or Microsoft or whoever, that's another thing because it makes it tougher for people to crack your stuff. So I don't want anybody out there getting cracked. So I thought I would bring this up uh, and mm -hmm. mention it. Enough of the preaching. On to the self promoting. So you guys are in the chat room. They're talking about me showing my uh, my fob online here. So I kid you not, I have a friend who has multiple fobs for this because it's one of those things where you know to get into this system he needs this fob and this system needs this fob, and he hated carrying them around. So he actually <laughs> he actually hung up a webcam and had all of his fobs hanging in front of the webcam so that he could just go to the webcam wherever he was and. Uh, 
and see all the fobs and figure out what they were. And then he had some problems because he set that up in the summer and then in the winter it got dark and he tried to get in there. So then he set up a, t a timed lamp that came on at like five in the afternoon and lit that room. Uh, it was pretty sad, but, uh, so you gotta watch out for, for webcams and, uh, and, and fobs. So say, shameless self-promotion. The reason we're all here tonight. Um, as always, SharePoint Conference, two weeks from today, we're all going to be at the SharePoint Conference. Two weeks. Got to get me started on some uh, PowerPoint decks. But again, we're doing the pre-conference install. That is on Sunday, March 2nd. The conference itself gets into full swing Monday, March 3rd. Shane and I are doing a session on Tuesday and two on Wednesday. We're doing load testing with Visual Studio, nuts and bolts of upgrading, PowerShell, and again, go out to myspc.sharepointconference.com, add all those up, add them to your, your schedule. I'm also going to be at the Nintex booth Sunday night uh, getting all that stuff set up. Once again, if you're interested in doing some kind of a uh, netcast hooligan breakfast or something, we need to do that. <laughs> Um, people in the chat room are asking if I can smuggle them in my suitcase. <laughs> he actually tell me how tall he is. Um, I, I don't know that I have that kind of room. Probably not. Uh, plus it's out of your way to come to Iowa, uh, from, uh, from where you're at. So coming to SharePoint conference, Rackspace will have a booth. We're going to be giving some fun stuff away. Uh, so check that out. There'll be more about that in a minute here. Uh, Javier Barrera is going to be at my session. So for goodness sakes, show up there just to see Javi, uh, and, and commiserate with him that he has to work with me all the time. He gets emails from me. Sometimes we talk on the phone. The man's a saint. He suffers for his art. There's no other way to put it, but the whole Rackspace crew, we're going to be there. And, uh, so, so come find that stuff out. Um, then in April at SP TechCon, I will be there. That's April 22nd through the 25th. You can find out about that at sptechcon.com and hopefully be doing some sessions there, netcasting and all that kind of stuff. The next month, the train keeps rolling on May 12th through the 15th. I will be at uh, Microsoft Tech Ed North America. We'll be doing the same uh, same pre-con there, and I don't know what sessions I haven't announced that yet. And the big news, the big news I've been teasing for the last couple of weeks that I had some new sessions to announce this is the netcast where I announce it. Uh, and I got word today that it was okay to mention it. And so a couple of you in the chat room, Ali and, uh, and John, I've, I've kind of already hinted at this before. But July 15th and 16th, I will be at the Australian SharePoint Conference uh, at the Hilton in Sydney. And then the next week, July 22nd and 23rd, I will be at the New Zealand SharePoint Conference in Auckland at the Langham. So that uh, looking forward to that. Went to the, Share, the Sydney SharePoint Conference last year, and it was a blast. Got me a sweatshirt. Oh, this is awesome. Met a bunch of the folks from down there. Had a blast. Loved every minute of it. And so did everything in my power to make sure that I got back down there. We got Chris in New Zealand. So he's going to have to let me let me share his island, or at least Auckland's on the North Island. I don't know uh, where Chris is at, so we might not have to share islands, but be very, uh, oh, he's going to be there. So we're, we'll see. We'll say, hey. So if you're going to be uh, at the Australian SharePoint Conference or the New Zealand, the Kiwi SharePoint Conference, I will be there. So uh, that'll be a good time. Been, been excited about that, known about that for about a month now. I just haven't been sure when they were announcing all that. I don't know what sessions I'm doing yet, but I'm going to be there. Maybe they'll just have me handing out like those forms that you fill out, your session evaluation forms, um, things like that. So <laughs> Eric's saying no one's on the South Island. Uh, could be, could be. So anyway, ran way over tonight. I apologize for that. Uh, but thanks, everybody. The chat room, you guys have been on fire tonight. I've been wanting to uh, chat more with you, but you guys are just all chatting amongst yourselves. It's way more entertaining than this trek is. Um, but thanks, everybody. Again, going to be at the SharePoint conference in a couple weeks. So by all means, say hey when you're there. You can check this out on YouTube at youtube.com slash Todd Clint Netcast. On Twitter at Todd Clint. In the email, todd.clint at rexpace.com. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to the chat room. You guys have been great, and you guys uh, have a good night.